Today's program is brought to you by Trace Vistas Recovery, located in San Juan Capistrano, California, an evidence-based and holistic healing sanctuary run by Dr. Daniel Hedrick. He's the same gentleman who treated me back in 2007. Check him out at tracevistasrecovery.com or give him a call at toll-free 844-900-0444. Trace Vistas employs the most dedicated and respected in the field of addiction recovery, Their team of proven individuals tailors treatments to suit each individual's addiction rehabilitation needs, and their complete staff is ready to help you get back on track to a full and enjoyable life. Trace Vistas Recovery, healing one family at a time. Welcome to the Todd Z Zcast, everybody. My name is Todd Zalkins, recorded live here in Long Beach, California, where we talk about a little bit of everything, a little bit of recovery, a little bit of this, that, and the other. Some things relevant and highly irrelevant. We're here to share with you what's really going on. Oh, man, we got a show for you guys today. I've, I've got a couple of just wonderful guests here that came a long, long ways to be here. We are joined today... Uh, with first off, we have Peter DeStefano, musician, composer, producer, guitarist. Um, came all the way from Ventura. Peter, thank you so much for coming. Oh, you're welcome. And we've also got Dr. <laughs> Callie Estes, who came all the way from the East Coast. She's an author and recovery coach. Callie, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and it's uh, you know, as you as we all all of us here know that the day started off kind of blue, and uh, Las Vegas is not a very cool place to be. And and our hearts and our prayers go out to. Uh, Everyone who's been affected, and there's a lot of people who's been affected. And I turned on the news today, and a lot of stuff going on there. And and uh, you know, we live in different times today, don't we, guys? We do. Uh, yeah, I I I personally think it's been you know we had Hitler, we've had Genghis Khan, we've just had bad always, and that was just a psychopath who did something horrible. You know, <laughs> hopefully we can learn more about psychopaths. I have a different theory. I have a theory that he lost a lot of money at the Mandalay Bay. You think so? I think so. And I think he was pissed. Because his profession was a gambler. And I think something snapped. And he started plotting and planning and came up with a with something. Hmm. I just I just remember growing up in the seventies and the early eighties, there was a large window of time where we just didn't hear about a lot of this stuff happening. And more and more stuff happens. We live in a sicker society. That's just my take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was a kid, I think it was in the 80s, someone went into McDonald's and shot a bunch of kids and and just psychopaths. People who I don't... I think that doctors need... We just need to learn more about when people snap and take out people, innocent Mm -hmm. people. I don't understand it at all. I'm a guitar player. But hopefully we can learn more about snapping prevention. That's a new course. Yeah. Snapping prevention. <laughs> Snapping yeah. prevention. I, I'm glad you just brought that up, Peter. I was just sharing that with Mike earlier this morning. I was actually um, three, min- three minutes away from being one of the victims in that restaurant. That was wow. Uh, oh, wow. in oh 1984. God. Yeah. That, that was at the uh, by the border in San Diego. Yes. It took place in San Ysidro. And at the time, that was the largest mass murder in American history. Yeah. I was on my way to go surfing with a buddy of mine. I was yeah. a junior in high school. We pulled up to the McDonald's parking lot. And I looked at my buddy and said, God, do we really want McDonald's right now? God, shine this. We drove further down the street. As we turned around after eating, all hell had broken loose. Yeah. And at the time, that was 21 people were killed, 19 others wounded. And it was one of those moments where, like, we would have, we were going in for a McMuffins. Yeah, no, it's just, but that, it, it's been happening for years. Yeah. So it's just people snap. So whatever the reason, gambling, love, whatever it is, um, or I don't understand it, but maybe we can we can as the government and doctors and everything can help to learn more about that line where people go psycho and do horrible things to innocent people. Well, I think we can always learn more, but but in uh, my my thing is that it's really not going anywhere because I I believe there's some guy in Iowa or some remote place going, you know what? Uh, I can outdo that. Yeah, yeah, and that's what mm-hmm. freaks the hell out of me. But yes, anyway, yes. Th- that's just a, th- that's how we opened up our day, and I think that we're going to talk about some 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 happier stuff and okay. and some cool stuff. I just uh, 
uh, my heart certainly goes out to the people and the families affected. Yeah, and God I, bless them all. No doubt about it. Yeah. I'm so happy you two are here. And, and again, yeah. thank you both for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here. And we're going to start off with Peter's backstory a bit. And then, and then uh, Dr. Callie, we're also going to, we're going to blend in your stuff. And I want, to, I want to talk about how you guys got joined up and all that good stuff. And, you know, Peter's got a colorful past. I know that you do as well, Callie. So, you know, Peter, you grew up in Santa Monica, mm-hmm. not too far away from 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 where I'm from in Long Beach. And you know, you're you, you were born in in '65. Yes. And did you grow up surfing in that area? Yes, I did. I grew up. Uh, I was on born in, in Santa Monica Hospital and raised on the north side of Santa Monica, north of Montana, to Sicilian parents, first generation born out here. And my father was a tailor and a singer, guitar player, songwriter, and. Um, his name was Vito. Um, and, uh, you know, I just grew up there and grew up in that whole Dogtown era, you know, with Tony Alva and Jay Adams. And Man. Tony Alva was from the north side and Jay Adams was from the south side, Venice. So Dogtown was just all of west side, you know. And the whole skating, surfing thing and music. It was, you know, skating pools, smoking weed and listening to Led Zeppelin. You know, I mean, those guys are like gods to us. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for, I, I, for me, you know, it, it it just helped my the whole guitar style. Like, I'm more influenced by Jay Adams on guitar than I am, you know, a guitar player. So, so that Zephyr Skate Crew, which we, if anyone knows anything about skating, was forget about next level. That was the level. Yeah. That that no one could possibly even fathom getting yeah. to. Yeah. Because they set the bar. Yeah. And um, and so did did your pop, did, you know, did your dad influence you in a lot of ways with with music? A hundred percent. I'm not even one tenth the power that he is at singing and playing guitar. You know, um, he was all heart and just real and great songwriter, the best singer, guitar player. He passed away in 2001 from cancer, but he, you know, it was a great life and. He made it to seventy one, so I'm grateful for that. At, at what age did you start? Did you start strumming? At what age were you exposed to the guitar? Thirteen, I would say. Thirteen was the age I remember where I said, "I love this more than women." Hmm. The guitar and so, express. It. I love music and poetry more than anything, and I made it then. And so it's been a you know whether money comes in or whether. You play to three people in a cave, or you play Woodstock, or where everything in between. It's all just part of the the journey of having to do it. Like Van Gogh painted two thousand three hundred works of art. He couldn't even sell one, but he did that much output. That's like three hundred Led Zeppelin albums worth of output in a few years. You know, so he was just nonstop painting and tortured. And so I feel like I'm one of those artists where I just. People are like, oh, you don't have an ego. You just came and played, you know, I just don't even give a shit about crowds or numbers. Or I have to play. So so you you invested just a tremendous, tremendous amount of time. And this thing, this guitar, basically, or a guitar, yeah. became an extension of self. And it was the most important thing in your life. Yeah, until heroin came. When when did that come? Then out? heroin became the most important thing, and I dropped everything. Now now before heroin came into play, I'm assuming uh, heroin wasn't the first thing that came into play. I'm assuming no was, no it was I was I didn't get abused. You know there's there's addicts I hear you know oh they were raped or they were abused or depressed or their parents you know I had a perfect upbringing on the north side of Santa Monica. I loved Keith Richards, Jimmy Page. I loved heroin addicts. You know I loved. John Coltrane, I go, and when I would watch, you know, TV, I would see Westerns, you know, where a guy would come in and kick open the saloon doors, get a shot of whiskey, cold cock someone, take a hooker upstairs. I go, that's what I'm going to do. I'm yeah. going to be that guy. You know what I mean? I love and that guy. so I just, from the get go decided, you know, I used to pretend I used to take, you know, a bottle of um, ginger ale and shake it. So the bubbles would all get out and then take my father's you know, he had a bar in our house and I would take shot glasses and put ginger ale in it. And I would take shots of ginger ale and then punch the pillows 
and then go upstairs with a pillow and make out. And, you know, I would pretend I was a drunk cowboy getting in a fight. So I was preparing myself for this, you know, and listening to Keith Richards and Monkey Man and, and Can't You Hear Me Knocking and, you know what I mean? And just, and the germs and going, oh my God, where's the needle? How do we do this? You know? The, the course was set for some rebellious behavior. Oh right? yeah, yeah. And I'm still in me. Like I love to be an outlaw, you know? And so I just, you know, that's how I got into it. But but before the heroin came into play for you, I'm assuming that you drank and did some other stuff. Oh yeah, I mean I I drank and everything, and you know Len, listening to Leonard Skinner, you know it's not how good you play, it's how much whiskey you drink, and you know my mind was just completely set to do this thing, but I went and got a wisdom tooth pulled, and they gave me Vicodin, and then when I did the Vicodin and listened to Led Zeppelin with a little vodka, that felt better than an orgasm with a girl, and I was like okay, this is better than sex. And then, and it won't hurt me because girls lie, steal, and cheat on me. Where this won't lie and steal and cheat, but it ended up hurting me more. I didn't realize, you know, I was going to be so in love with this drug that was so hard to get, you know? I always thought that... that, that Enough op- of, <laughs> you know? <laughs> totally get that. I always yeah. felt that opiate rush was, was yeah. kind of... So, I was equated to as like I was being hugged by God times 10. Um, yeah. Okay, so so as you're jamming guitar in your early teens and and you're getting better and better, uh, the first band that you were in was a band called K Thirty Eight. Well, actually, it was called Misty Faith. It was me and Eric Avery, the bass, the original bass player for Jane's Addiction, and this guy Sean Sullivan, and we just played inside of a garage. And I remember doing Sympathy for the Devil, and I remember Eric having this energy, and it felt so good. And that was it. You know, I was off and running, and that was in junior high school. And then um, in high school, I played a party with this guy, Tim Paul Material. Their band was called Adrenaline, and I faced my back towards the crowd. I was terrified, but it felt so good. Then that same night, I took the drummer and the bass player, and we went to go play this other party. And there it was like, you know, a party that wanted, you know, soul music and stuff. And I was like, I'll play black magic woman from Carlos Santana. And then they booed us and the drummer and everything were, you know, and they made us stop after half the song. And I was like, I can handle this. I just experienced the best at a party with my back turned. And then a couple of hours later I got booed and they made us stop because we sucked so bad. This is a lot easier than surfing big waves because I wanted to be a big wave surfer. And I would always go out in the big waves and go, mommy, please, when the sets would come and go, no, and you know what I mean? And go underwater. And that's real fear for me, you know, it's, it's, but I surf big waves, but I'm still very afraid of it. Where a crowd, it's like, they'll just boo you and throw shit at you. And I can handle that, you know? So, so was the crew that you were hanging out with pretty much you're, you're all in with the music and are you still surfing, skating? And is this, this is this, this is your life. Yeah, and then and then what happened was it was it was fun parties and everything, and then I met Perry on a surf trip. Perry Farrell was this down in Mexico? In Mexico, Puerto Escondido, surfing big waves and stuff. And so it was an arranged. He wanted it. It was an arranged thing because he had heard a demo that I did and heard, and I was like a Stooges guitar player. And I, at that point, I hadn't even heard of the Stooges, so he had an intention, and I had an intention. You know, I want to play Lollapalooza with my band and. I never thought I would be in a band with him, you know. What year was this, by the way? Like 90, 99? 90. Okay. 1990. Okay. And then um, we shared a cabana and we got along. We were all kicking heroin. And this guy, Greg, brought Bupernex. I think we got Bupernex. So we were using that to, to, to help kick. And at that point, I was into heroin. And so we had that together, that we liked that. We liked, you know, good music and Hendrix and stuff. And then... You know, then when Perry, you know, it started happening with Perry and the big crowds and everything. And then, and that's when pain started happening because people were like, oh, you're going to break up Jane's addiction and start with this guy. Who's this guy? You know what I mean? And that whole thing and the heroin helped cover that up, you know, and, um, and then just, you know, girls lying, stealing and cheating on me and heroin helped cover that pain. So then I started to use it. Not from like my parents and stuff, but from girls, lo- lovers going wrong, you know, you start to cover the pain. So it was no longer fun. It was a painkiller, literally. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to picture you and Perry Farrell down in Mexico in this pretty heavy spot where the waves are. I mean, when it's going, yeah. that place can absolutely ruin you. Oh, yeah. You're, you're kicking 
uh, you're kicking heroin yeah. together. And are you guys just clicking as, as bros and you're kicking this thing? Uh, did you guys just get on famously? Yeah, because I was, he saw, like, he auditioned like 100, even Steve Vai auditioned for him and everything for this Porno for Pyros thing. And he, we were all playing and everyone was going as fast as they can. And I was hitting one note every 10 seconds to try to make music with everybody. And they noticed that this guy's not like, playing for ego he's trying to make the ensemble sound good you know so perry liked my mannerisms and my intentions intentions are everything and he loved that i was on fire and ready to just be as evil and i carried a 25 gun you know a little shooter in my boot and i like black girls and i was just you know just bad and he liked it. And so he's like, he's the guy. So it was for on. Porn for porn for Yeah, it was, it was more the way I was living, you know, and just loving needles and heroin and hookers and carrying a gun. And, and you know, d- during the riots, we, you know, I, I did some bad, you know. 92. Drive-bys. And, you know, I was a bad man, yeah. you know. And, you know, he wanted the real deal for Poro for Paro. So he got it, you know, I'm still a bad person, but I don't lie, steal or cheat. And I'm just honest. Yeah. And I don't break the law. Recovery changes a lot of the things, a lot of the yeah. behaviors yeah. that, uh, that we uh, used to do. Yeah. Now I just right? go nuts on the guitar. I love that. I love that. Now when porn, I got a quick question about the, about the band name. I mean, porno, porno, People who love fire. Uh, any idea how that name manifested? One hundred percent. There's a guy named Stuart Ross. Uh-huh. He was the accountant for um, Jane's Addiction at the time, and Perry was watching or was looking at a fireworks catalog, and he got to the centerfold that it had all of the products you can buy in one thing, and then Stuart looked over his shoulder and goes, "Ah, that's a porno for pyros." And then Perry goes, that's what we're going to name the band. He didn't have the name of the band yet. We, we were like a band and we were talking about it. And then, so Stuart Ross came up with the name. When I first heard it, I just go, that's genius. Yeah. It's just genius. And so you guys formed this band. And and, and then I wanted Martine. I knew about Martine from the Two Free Stooges. He was this guy with a missing tooth and he was just this Dutch, just wicked. Yeah. Gnarly, alcoholic, bad boy and so it was like i we auditioned a bunch of bass players but i was like he's the guy and and then steven and perry listened to me was that just was it awesome playing with steven on drums yeah he's like an octopus you know an energy octopus man i still love playing with him in hell ride and you know we we will do porno again when the time is right you know it's just that it's hard because it's like i'm i'm uh you know you get together and you try to do this thing and and the way I live is very offensive to people. You know, I'm married with children and I'm in an open relationship and I have girlfriends and I do whatever the fuck I want, you know, but I'm honest about it up front mm-hmm. and I don't tell people what I'm doing. Um, like, it's like we both share a toilet. I don't have to tell you every time I take a shit and how I wipe my butt, but you know, we're going to, I'm going to use it. And that's the same way that I roll. You know, I'm going to see other girls and I'm going to be do what I want. So if you want to hang with me, that's how I roll. And it's very painful because you got to take what you give, you know? And so there's certain lines like, you know, you have family members, coworkers, and they just cross every line to try to get to you, you know, and it hurts, but I'd rather do that than lie, steal and cheat or sneak and be a coward. Sounds like you know who you are. Yeah, a I'm a womanizer. Extent. I like women. <laughs> yeah. You know? And I, you know, my kids know every, you know, it's just, there's no, if I was to die and they were defined, there's nothing to find out. It's mm. like, I'm ready to face my maker. I'm ready to die. You know, it's like, there's no, oh God, they're going to find out. Something. Shelf's clean, man. Yeah, I sleep good at night. I don't need anything. Now, the, the band was together for about five years and, yeah. um, and you guys had some. You guys had some success. Album went gold, and yeah. and you had a a pretty significant, pretty gnarly health scare. Yeah, it was wonderful. I mean, I 
I, uh, Is it okay to talk about oh, that? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I went through eight drug rehabs and everything. And then what happened was I, in my last, re, in my second to the last rehab, I stole, I, when everybody was sleeping, I went through, there was like eight people in the rehab. It was a little ghetto thing in, in, uh, in uh, Oxnard. And I stole every, but all the cash out of everybody's wallets while they were sleeping. And then I got caught. And I had to, everybody had to wake up and, you know, I had to give everybody's humiliating. I had to give everybody their money back. And then they were going to try to figure out what to do with me. And I went into the bathroom and I kicked out the window. It had like a mesh on it. And I kicked out the mesh and I jumped out. And there was a guy in a van mailing letters. And I jumped in his van and stole his car while it was, because he kept it running. And then raced the van down from Oxnard to Venice, sold everything out of it. There were surfboards and everything. And then lived in the van for a couple of days and just shot heroin. And I overdosed it in the van and a homeless man smashed my left testicle to keep me alive. And uh, then I just kept partying. And then I was laying next to my wife and I felt it down there. I was like, oh my God, it's flattened. And I thought she did it because she was so mad that I was such a junkie and hawking everything out of the house. So for a while, I thought she did it. And then another junkie told me, yeah, F Frank, the homeless guy, smashed your testicle because you were blue and stopped breathing and your lips were black. And he, or whatever he did, he fucked with me. I don't know. And so I ignored it. And it turned into cancer because I was chain smoking cigarettes and smoking crack and shooting heroin and, and all that chemical stuff while it was healing itself just turned it into free ride and it just went nuts and it spread everywhere. And I was supposed to die and... And I got it removed immediately. Dr. Drew found it. I was in a, another rehab and Dr. Drew goes, yeah, you're a fourth stage alcoholic, but you're going to die if you don't get this. This is cancer, you know. So the next day I got it removed and um, and uh, they said I had vascular invasion. So I had to go do chemotherapy. So we had to stop porno for paros. It wasn't looking good for me, you know, junkie, heroin addict, cancer, you know, bald and everything. So then they started Jane's addiction again and went off and I was supposed to die. And then had an out of body white light experience and uh, I was hovering over my body and like instinct, everything came into me. It said, join AA, marry the woman that had your child, be honest. Um, and everything, I was chain smoking two packs of Marble Reds a day. I was on every psych med, I was on Ambien, Zoloft, everything, it just all went away. And I just stopped taking everything and there was no no fight anymore. It, that it, was just gone. And But I had to then do the steps, do AA, do the whole thing. You know, I know we're not supposed to talk about what we do publicly, you know, in the program, but that's, I'm a stage four alcoholic. That's what worked for me. Yeah. And what Callie has is six models of, of treatment, which I wish... I'm a recovered, you know, a certified recovery coach, nationally recovery coach, thanks to Callie. She, I went through her school and I wish I would have had that for Chester Bennington and for mm. Chris Cornell because there's certain people, like for me, without a doubt, stage four abstinence with a program is, the, God is the only way I'm going to stay sober. But other people, you can do, Okay, they just have a coke problem, but they can still drink and smoke. But when you take it all away from them, you know, it you have to try all all six models and she'll tell you more about those models before you give someone abstinence, you know. What's good for a stage 4 alcoholic might not be good for stage 1. You're going to kill them if you take away their freedom and their their peace, their their right to chemical peace, their right to a drink of a glass of wine. Perry is a perfect example. He was a gnarly junkie. He can enjoy a glass of wine. Keith Richards, he's not a stage four. He's having a great life. He's a plane are, right now in his seventies. You know, are you, are, Fuck. When you talk about stages. Are you? I'm I'm assuming that there's different levels of degrees. I'm going to let the doctor talk about okay. that because I'm okay. a guitar player, stage okay. four <laughs> junkie. Yeah, because I know what level I am. Yeah. I'm a stage four, or you a stage four? I'm 10? a level 10. A level, yeah, okay, yeah. What well, In the book, I'm talking about the, our book. The yeah. AA, it says stage four alcohol. There's one, yeah. the moderate, heavy. Yeah, this, I'm a level 10. A real alcoholic. I'm a real alcoholic. I'm a real. Yeah, I'm a real too. Meaning I can't touch anything. Yeah, yeah. Period. And then, but at least you know, like Clint oh, Eastwood said, a man needs to know his limitations. Yeah. I know my limitations. If I have, if I have one cocktail, guess yeah. what? And I can have one today. 
tomorrow I might have two to three, and that's going to lead up to about a half ounce of cocaine. It's going to lead to oh, a bunch yeah. of heroin. And then I'm going to have um, uh, the, the other things that you're talking about, which yeah. is a variety of women, bad hotel rooms, yeah. different zip codes, airline flights, and I hate myself, and I hate my life, and I don't talk to my mom anymore. No, That's, that's my good. equation. Well, t- I want to get to that those phases. Definitely, I want you to comment on that. I want to talk about your sobriety date. Okay. So what, so, so what was that moment? You said this experience, bam, oh my God, it's lifted. When was this? July 24th, 1997. Wow. So you just celebrated, is it 20 years? Yeah, I'm a little over 20 years. Congratulations. Old. Thank you. That is freaking awesome. Yeah, and, I, and I've gone through, you know, I buried my father, made sure his body was nice in the casket and dressed. I was the only one in the family who did that. And I've walked through... Being cheated on. I've been in a mental ward at 10 years sober, you know, found the love of my life, having an affair with a police officer, and I lost my mind. And and instead of drinking and using, I went in a mental ward and they locked me up and said I was delusional. And and then I after three months of investigation, the they found out I wasn't delusional. It really happened. And you know, so I've been through a war sober too you know what i mean it's not just for sure but you don't have to drink and use and you don't have to kill yourself you know i, I want to ask you a question about some of the some of the emotional challenges you've dealt with in sobriety because i i've been diagnosed on several occasions with clinical depression uh as a result of 17 years of opiate addiction where where i've been told that my brain can no longer particularly uh, manifest dopamine and serotonin on its own and i believe that to be true because even as a sober guy doing all the work we do in recovery, I've had long stretches of zero joy. I mean, nothing but darkness and look at that beautiful day and I want to kill myself. Yeah. Now, in your recovery, uh, Peter, have you had stretches of time um, that, that you're just down here? Constantly. Down here. Constantly. And how have you, um, have you stayed down there for a long time and how did you get out of it or did you just, or did you just find yourself... You know what? I'm no longer there anymore, and the day just changed. Or the mo- I don't want it to change. I want I want to be there. I mean, that's why I listen to Bob Dylan songs. You know, Tangled Up in Blue, or or you know, if you see her, say hello, Bob Dylan. You know, Robert Johnson. The, life is a beating. Okay, as we witnessed this morning with what happened, it, there's all those families. All the you know, there's five over 500 people injured, still bleeding. You know. And over 50, you know, 60 people dead, all their families, their kids, all everybody that's, it's a beating life. So we're not alone in this, in this agony. You can't go through life a full, all four of your seasons, you know, without some kind of pain, you know. But, but my question to you is how, have you ever had any tools or anything that you've done to maybe get yourself out of this, out of the hole or out of the rabbit hole? for when you've been stuck has it been music any types of forms of physical thing that you know i started doing this and god i just slowly got out of that freaking rut man because it sucks when you're in it when it's dark for extended periods yeah um is it songwriting is it or you know what it just lifts sometimes it just lifts it goes away i'm not talking about a bad weekend i'm talking about when you're in it for weeks and weeks and weeks because i've been there and it sucks god is either everything or he's nothing i agree and so <laughs> I agree when nothing else works like music, a girl, sex, food, an AA meeting, whatever, you know, prayer, books, prayer, da, 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 da. it's it, you're either going to crumble or you it's going to, you know what I mean? Be lifted and there'll be waves of um, it's a pain that starts and stops like a circular thing. And you can be in love with someone who doesn't love you, you know, and they're doing something behind your back. You, your intuition knows your best friend is sleeping with your lover and you just, but you don't have any proof of it, you know, but your intuition knows and the spirits and the ghosts, everybody's trying to, you know, there's, there's a war happening outside of you and you don't know what it is and it's just killing you and you can't get facts because nobody will be honest. And then it ends or they fight and then the girl ends up calling you and then he's like, oh, hey, what's going on? And I'm not saying this is happening, but it happens constantly. Yeah. 
you know, and this brothers shall- sleeping with their wives and, you know what I mean? Brother, you know, it's just life is a beating, man. And this too shall pass, right? That, that saying, this too shall pass. These saying we go in phases, life goes in phases and, and shit does happen, right? Yeah. And you shit just, yeah, I just, if I knew more about all of that. So, so what it comes down to is the safest thing for me is to love music and poetry. Then it, it it doesn't lie, steal, or cheat for me. I've got two more questions for you, and I want to I want to get with how, what you two are doing, and I want to hear about these. Is it four stages or four six? It's not stages; it's different styles. Yeah, oh, six getting, models, so, okay. models of yeah. Yeah. Okay, I want to direct two quick questions to Peter, and I want, and I want to get to this team here. Um, first is is are you still surfing? Oh yeah. Totally. Are, you lo- are you loving it? Yeah, I got the I just got this little stump board. They're little foam quad fin boards that are like yeah. up to your halfway up your chest and they fit in the Cadillac perfect. Just in a trunk, you know? huh? Yeah, yeah. They're just little <laughs> boards. But they float you better than any board and they're just little foam. It's called a stump board. So it's a new little Grom technology. So I'm having fun with my stump board up in Ventura County. I love living up there. The surf nice. up there is insane. And then I wanted to bounce this off you. Are you do you just love playing music sober? Yeah, it's it's clean. It's real. There, it's just a, just like this whole nylon string thing that I'm doing with no effects, just strings directly to the house. You know, with no effects, no reverb, no pedals, no distortion, no tubes, nothing. The same thing with play, listening and playing music sober. It's just the real deal. You're not getting fooled by some enhancement you you this is real powerful music because there's no drug and it's making me feel like a drug you know yeah and and that's what i want our listeners our list, i want our listeners to hear that that we've got a gentleman here who's rocked tens of thousands of people loaded and sober yeah and and you're you're telling these people that uh, it's better sober am i right a hundred percent i love that thanks for telling our listeners that man yeah now yeah. dr Callie. Would you please tell everybody how you met this gentleman? <laughs> he was referred from um, a friend of mine who has a rehab in Mexico. And he said, the two of you need to meet because you guys are sort of both out there, as he put it. And I said, that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> so when I met Peter, we just started talking and it was all these different um, things that he's doing and the things that I'm doing. And they had some synchronicity. And I do a lot of work with musicians and actors and actresses that are trying to get sober, but I do it differently. Most of the things, and these are the, the models we're talking about, most of the ways people get sober are abstinence, 12-step. There are other ways besides 12-step. And I was explaining that to him, and he was like, oh, you're kidding. One of them is harm reduction, and that's what I do. So not necessarily every addict needs to be totally abstinent. They can, say, for example, your drug of choice is heroin. You can go to the bar and have one drink and it doesn't lead to heroin. You can be in the harm reduction program versus somebody who has one drink and it leads to another drink, which leads to cocaine and women and zip codes and all that. That's a little different. So there's different styles of treatment for different styles of people. One is Christian based or or Jewish based. They turn their entire will over to God, strictly religion. They go to church, they follow church teachings and they get sober through the church. Um, For me, it was fitness. I got sober on a yoga mat because my first addiction is food. My secondary is diet pills. A didn't work and I didn't work. And I ended up in a yoga mat with a yoga teacher who said, you're putting things in your body because you don't like to feel a certain way. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. Yoga changes how I feel. You guys were talking about the serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine boost, sex, food, music, and exercise boost serotonin. That's why you're happy all the time. You're always playing music and you're always having sex. Yes. So you're keeping your serotonin norepinephrine naturally up. But when you first get sober, the serotonin norepinephrine is depleted. So things like sweet potatoes will boost your tryptophan, which will boost your serotonin. So there are natural ways to do it. There's also um, vitamins and supplements that will boost it. But you can do exercise. I have my clients do squats. When they say I'm depressed, I can't get out of bed. I make them do squats, literally, because it jacks up their serotonin. Now, now, it sounds, in some ways, though, is it is it a real independent way to recover? I, 
and I, I want to have I want to have a dialogue here for a second. I I'm a member, um, and I'm proud uh, to be a, a member of a twelve step community, and and I've got a, you know, a, a large fellowship of people that have saved my life, and I'm I'm glad I'm a part of it. And it's worked well for me. I'm, what I'm hearing is is it is there is it, kind of just an individual way of, and I re- listen. There's a lot of ways to recover, and I'm glad that there's a lot of ways. Mo- there's more than one way to recover. That's for sure. So just to, to have a dialogue about this, are you suggesting that for some of your clients or for a lot of these people you've worked with, you've developed some ways where, hey, look, I can help you in this regard where you don't have to immerse yourself into a 12-step program. And really what you can do is just recover independently. And and my question is this, because when I've had, especially in early recovery, when we're really raw, when we're really scared, when we're extremely vulnerable, what happens with with your people that you've worked with when they're really on edge? Okay, and if they're really kind of by themselves, what happens during those moments when they're when they're gonna fucking use, when they're gonna fucking drink? They pick up the phone and call me. Okay. So and I'm not a sponsor, the, but I'm a coach. So I'm trained okay. in coaching and counseling. So it's a little bit different. Okay. Now some of them are in the fellowship. Some of them are in twelve step. What what I offer is I meet them where they are. For some of them, abstinence at this very moment isn't even fathomable. Maybe a year from now it is. But they're still doing lines here and there. Or they're not going to give up whatever their, their vice is. And then we can go that direction. But for some of them, their vice may not be the thing that bothers them. Like, for example, you were talking about, I think it was Perry, you said he can have a glass of wine, it doesn't bother him. There's uppers and downers. Most people who like to fly don't like to go down. So drinking, it doesn't interest them. They don't want three, four, or five glasses of wine because they like cocaine or they like speed. It's the opposite. So they'll go to the bar, have a glass of wine, and be done with it because it doesn't fulfill the way they want them to. They want themselves to feel, which is happy, excited, bubbly on eleven. Okay. So they'll reject that drug of choice. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And so when you mention harm reduction, so for instance, a, a heroin addict, you, 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 uh, the the way to go in a lot of cases is just. And as I'm going to stop sticking, you. There's no harm reduction for heroin. Heroin well, is harm, a okay. li- li- live or die. Okay, but hold on. Harm reduction, often what a lot of doctors do, and I'm sure you're aware of this, and I can't stand it. Here you go. Here's Suboxone for the next three years, and that's, that's really dangerous. That's not harm reduction. That's MAT therapy. So that's medically assisted therapy. So that's a little different. Yeah. What they do is they say, well, you're already doing opiates. We're going to give you a low-grade opiate that's safer yeah. than the opiate you have because at least you won't die. Well, the problem is coming off Suboxone, coming off methadone, coming off buprenorphine, it's even harder than heroin. I used to get my clients back on heroin and then get them sober because... I had to do that to get off methadone. It's tough, isn't it? Oh, 30-day <laughs> kick? You know, you don't sleep for 30 days? Not sleeping for 30 days with bone agony. Yeah. You know, is Yeah, I had to get it's back terrible. on heroin to get off it. Okay, so 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 I'm, this is cool. The, these things that you're offering, that you're sharing with what you're doing with people, um, keep going. Tell t- no, you're you're sharing with 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 all of us the these things that you're doing to inspire and get people on on this better path. And that's the goal. The goal with with harm reduction or the goal with any alternative program is that you come in and you leave better than what you came in at. Yeah. So if you're coming in and you're doing three lines a day your goal may be to do two lines a day and then one line a day and then cocaine once a week and then maybe once a month that might be our goal to get you through um with heroin most people come to me and they say i want off heroin i mean you don't say hey i want to try to medically manage my heroin use you're not going to be able to do it so they come and they want off but they don't want to go through the sickness so it becomes what do i do so i use cannabis i get them on marijuana because it reduces the late cramps, the insomnia, the headache, all that nonsense, the um, not being able to eat. All of that goes away. The vomiting doesn't go away. You gotta go through that. But once you're through it, you feel 10 times better. Now everyone says, well, are they addicted to cannabis? No, it's not their drug of choice. Heroin addicts generally don't like cannabis. It's not enough. It's just a little fuzzy and then, you know, so that's my theory. My theory is if I can get you off something that's that bad using something else, 
Let's do it. But okay, let me ask you this though: but if you're if you're getting off of heroin, and and again, this is just a question: Are you robbing Peter to pay Paul with the strength with the strains of cannabis today? Which let's face it, I mean, Peter back in the day, <laughs> joints was just like no big deal. You take a couple of puffs. These days, my God, I've heard about. I I haven't had pot these days. I haven't smoked it in tw- in twelve years. I just hear these horror stories about the the strength the the strain or the intensity of it. So what I'm what I'm curious about is, so if they're not doing heroin anymore and they're smoking, you know, weed regularly, is that a new dependence for them? Good question. So the average weed. So back in the day when we would all get a little dime bag, it was about twenty five percent THC. That's yeah. what you were getting. Now it goes up to about forty five percent. That's in your edibles and your and your you know smoking. You can take it higher. You're gonna have. It's not going to be enjoyable. It's gonna be like an LSD trip. So it's not as much fun as you think it is. So the objective isn't to start them out with 200 milligrams edible. The objective is let's start you out with 50 milligrams. Tell me how you feel. Do you feel the lessening of the nausea? Do you feel the less? The objective is to use it as a medical tool to get you off heroin. Not go, here's marijuana, start smoking marijuana, eat pizza, play Xbox, because you're gonna do this now for the rest of your life. It's as a detox protocol, instead of Suboxone, instead of methadone. Do I want you off marijuana? Absolutely. I don't want you to sit around and smoke it all day. But if you have to maintain at 45%, you're not going to be out of your mind. What you're talking about is the dabbing. The 90% THC, they dry it and it looks like glass. Yeah. I'm curious. You know, I'm. we're talking about the levels. <laughs> I, I certainly know, like, I, I have a full understanding mm-hmm. of, of, of the type of, of alcoholic and drug addict that I am. And... When when you're dealing with an individual like this, let's just say that you know this. Hey, this guy's a heroin addict, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give him uh, I'm gonna prescribe. It sounds like some type of THC regimen. What I'm wondering is, left alone, I think to a junkie's device. Okay, if you're if he gets on a THC regimen, and Peter, tell me what your thought is. This as you're using THC for a little bit, I go right to you know what this THC just isn't enough. The THC isn't enough. I think I want a little bit something more. You know what I mean? Like, does that make sense? Like, this is okay. <laughs> this just sounds really no, good. No, well, well, that's why, it, you know, that's why I need, I, the six models of treatment that are in the lessons that I learned to become a recovery coach, I did naturally. I tried to drink red wine with my father and have spaghetti and meatballs. A week later, I had a restraining order from my wife and I was in an alley with a needle and a spoon. I tried to smoke one joint with Perry after kicking and coming out of rehab. A week later, I was smoking crack and crying, trying to smoke crack like a gentleman, you know, and I couldn't do it, you know. So in our book, the AA Mm -hmm. book that you and I both, the only way that you and I can be sober, okay, there's four stages of the alcoholic. We're stage four. But I needed to go through those six models naturally and try all those things and God. And I moved to Lake Shrine and I tried Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Okay, that's how much I tried it. I can say it that fast. Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, and, and you know, yoga, everything. Lake Shrine had all five religions. I did everything. The only way that worked for me, I did exercise, surf trips all over the world. I did doctors. I did methadone. I did every medication, suboxone. I did everything, right? That was invented at the time. Is abstinence with a program and the steps. That's the only thing that works for Peter Stefano. Do I believe that? That's for everyone. Not, not at all. I believe I've, I've witnessed it where people in my life have done all six of your models. So I want, I wanted to get educated to help people to find out if what of those six. So where do you fit in? Is that what you're saying? Like which, which which one? one will try every, try everything before we take everything from you. First try everything, so then you'll be at peace knowing 
you're a real alcoholic. It says in our book, try controlled drinking. Mm -hmm. Bring your sponsee to the bar. It says this in the book. Have him try controlled drinking. Have him take a shot. It's worth a bad case of the jitters for him to understand his condition fully. Mm -hmm. If he can drink like a gentleman, our hats are off to him. These are all words from the book, mm -hmm. okay? We are not men who can drink like gentlemen. We're like men who have lost our legs. We never grow new ones, okay? You and I, stage four, okay? Stage three, there's other models. Stage two, there's other models. Stage one, it's all works together. Okay. We're level four gangsters. We're level <laughs> four. Like in prison, there's level four prisoners. Yeah. We're level four addicts i'm proud to be that man i'm a fucking passionate dude man all in or nothing i'll fucking die for the needle you know i'm yeah. fucking i'm like you know those dudes who take a machine gun and run this storm the lines for their country i for heroin i'll fucking die for you know what i mean i'm, I'm one of those dudes you know thank god i didn't die now i can have that passion and love for music and poetry instead of you know a piece of tar or some fucking fluffy white powder or a cold small beer is there is there any because this is really interesting and and I I totally totally believe that there are that there are people who uh, see I call them borderlines borderlines you, you may not be an alcoholic I know some people that 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 are in recovery and I'm oh my God you just I don't, I'm glad you're sober but it's just <laughs> you know and 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 by the way and I've seen them get sober for a while. And they go out and they have really manage their lives quite fine. In fact, I've run into them from time to time. And they, like you're talking about, they have just, maybe they drink red wine with their dad. And they have pasta and they're doing just fine. Talk That's okay. Let me tell you about a guy, a dear friend of mine, Aaron, who was 13 years sober. When I first got out of my last rehab, last, he was the first one to pick me up at 6 a.m. and took me to a 6.45 a.m. meeting and made me sit in the front my first day out of rehab when in nineteen, you know, uh, ninety seven, everything. He drinks now, and does fine, and has been drinking for years with his family. He runs a a movie studio. Stuff. He's got tons of money. He's doing great. Yeah. Who's maybe stage three heavy drink? You know what I mean? So I've seen it. All. That's why I'm doing this. It's because I've seen it. You know, and a lot of people. They, they take them, they might be stage three or lower and they take everything away from them and then they then want to have a drink and then they lose their dignity and they commit suicide because every humans were judgmental. That's not fair. That's how Peter and I got involved yeah. in this okay. project together because he's seen it from that side. Most musicians and actors and actresses, it's a very incestuous circle. So you go to someone you know and they take you to an AA meeting. And what if it doesn't work? You're sitting at the AA meeting going, this isn't for me. I know I want to drink, but this is my only option because of who I am. I can't go out there publicly and start looking for help or an NA meeting. Same exact thing. So no one ever offers them harm reduction. They're offered, this is what we do. You get sober, you do no drugs, no alcohol. That's it. Have your monster, have your coffee, have your Snickers bar, but you can't have glass wine. And it doesn't work for them. That's where we started teaming up because we're going to offer a solution, extra services, something else. So if you go to an AA meeting and you don't feel this is for me, what do you do? Okay, so okay, so so are these people then, um, Callie, that that don't feel like they don't have a fatal illness? They just are doing too much of something else. See, now we're going to get really controversial. No, no, no. I, I, but I'm not trying to even promote. There's no controversy. This no, no, is no. This, this, no, this dialogue controversy. This is dialogue. So right now we have all my colleagues arguing over, is this a disease right now? This is what's happening behind the scenes. So we've announced this is a fatal disease, right? You're going to die. Oh, I've got it. Okay. Yeah, I do too. Now you've got PhDs and doctors going, well, maybe it's not a fatal disease. Maybe it's an attachment disorder. Maybe it's a trauma-based bond. So now you've got a whole other separate ball of wax going on behind the scenes in the colleague industry, in the addiction industry, we're all arguing over, well, what if it's this and what if it's that? So now, the way we're looking at it is to take the individual, not the drug of choice. Take the actual individual and say, what happened to you? Why do you use? Mm -hmm. And what are you getting out of it? I, I agree. So we're solving 
the problem, which is not drugs or alcohol. Something okay. has got you here. I, I completely agree. I, I can't. I don't want to do a blanket argument about the disease as a whole. Mm-hmm. Okay. First off, it's like what is going on with you? Mm-hmm. Okay. And and I like when Peter said, "Yeah, I agree. I have a fatal illness too. I know that I personally." What happens with me when I ingest drugs or alcohol? Mm-hmm. I don't need to do a big effing roadmap of my backstory with my familial tree. Mm-hmm. It's irrelevant. Yeah, all my males on my father's side, we all have alcoholism on my mom's. It doesn't exist. It doesn't matter. Let's say it didn't exist in my family tree. I still have it. What am I going to do about it? What am I going to do about my situation, about my addiction and my alcoholism? What are we going to do with this person that Callie's got in front of them? Right? Mm-hmm. What's the solution? How are we going to deal with it? All this arguing, all about this therapy. Let's just do something about the person and their problem. Is that what you're getting at? Exactly. Okay. So instead of arguing over, you know, what should we do? What's the solution for you? What I do is I take the individual and I'm going to ask you 101 questions. How did you get from point A to point B? How did you get here in this scenario? And where do you want to go? So if you know that drinking is going to lead to cocaine is going to lead to zip codes and disappearing, then drinking is going to be off the table. So as, as a professional, it's the first thing I'm going to tell you is you can't drink. You have to go abstinence base. If that leads to all these things and you know that we can't go down that path. Does that make sense? But, okay. Yeah. So if I roll up and I say, Callie, I cannot stop. I, you know, the moment I start drinking Coors, I go right to JD. I score half ounce of blow. I got a grip of Oxycontin. I start smoking heroin. I am routing out hookers in Vegas. And my uh, wife keeps finding out, by the way, the wife is no longer there. But this is what I keep doing all the time. Every time, this is what happens when I drink. I'm going to ask you this question. Do you <laughs> do you do those other activities without the alcohol? Um, this is just what I do, period. This is my M.O., in fact, I do it all the time. And if I don't do this, I can't even wake up out of bed. I've got to start chewing pills and I've got to drink all the time. There's, this is what I do. So can you do those activities independent of alcohol? Or are they all convoluted? You have to do something. There has to be something. I like all of it. Then you have to go abstinent-based. Because I, if it's all the nonsense, you know, see, then you know. But go. I have people that come to me and say, well, it doesn't go that direction. So... The alcohol doesn't lead to, to blow, which doesn't lead to hookers. They might start with the hookers and say, well, that leads to this, this, and the other. And I say, well, wait a minute. You may not have an alcohol and drug problem. You might be a sex addict. Let's talk there first because that's a whole different ball of wax. You have to remember when people go to treatment, they address drugs and alcohol. They don't address secondary addiction. Sex, gambling, fitness, food, Facebook. There's always a secondary addiction. That's never addressed. So the first thing I want to know is what's your secondary addiction? And is that maybe your primary and you're covering it up with drugs and alcohol? Some people are sex addicts, but they would never go to Vegas and go to the chicken ranch unless they were lit. They get lit to go do the activity. Mm -hmm. So are you really a drug addict? Are you a sex addict who uses drugs to actually go through your addiction? Yeah, so so they're they're not not out in Vegas like having a burger and fries with their buddy Paul and a couple of cokes going, hey, Paul, let's go get hookers. That just doesn't happen. Usually it's after like 15 Mai Tais. Right. And they go, hey, Paul, it's time to go to the, to the chicken ranch. Mm-hmm. It's usually when not sober. Right, Peter? Well, I, <laughs> the, the thing for me, and, and I think Callie will, will back this, I love to get high, okay? I get high internally now. I, I used to use external chemicals and alcohol to get it. Now, I surf. I have tons of sex with different women. I um, get up in front of crowds. I chase, you know, I listen to music and stuff like that. I do, I hang out with motorcycle gangsters and gangsters and I do dangerous behavior and risky stuff because it gets me high. So you're so you're an a, a, a adrenaline junkie. <laughs> yeah. Just gonna say, time and so, five. but I like it. I like it. I so I don't have to be a glum lot that doesn't get high. I get high in different ways now, you know. So you learned how to use your body's own natural juices to yes. do what it was supposed to do. Yes, thank you. And that's clients don't understand that. They don't know what to do with that. What I like about our 
about our dialogue, Callie and Peter, is that, you know, I need to be open minded to all sorts. And I am open minded to that. There are success stories. And it sounds like you've had success, a lot of it with um, other forms of recovery. And, and that's what's important. And I'm also a huge believer in if someone is getting well doing A, B or C, hey, man, so long as they're getting sober, I could care less. And I, I, I think it's awesome that you're doing however it is you're developing it, however it is you're doing it. It's freaking cool. You know, and I and I I'm in my little thing doing my deal. And, and you know, you're opening you're opening my eyes to new and different stuff. And we need to be open minded. Right, Peter? Well, that's why I'm a 20 year sober AA guy. I'm a staunch, staunch AA dude. You are okay. staunch. You know what I mean? You? you know what I mean? I'm I am. That is the only way for Peter to Stefano. period. Nothing else is going to work. So I can give I have the right to say I back these other ways because yeah. I'm 20 years over 20 years sober abstinence in a program the steps i sponsor people you know what i mean i Pass, so passing it on is pretty important to us isn't it well it's you know it carrying the message is important to guys like us is that not right it's it was given to me for free and fun and i have to give it for free and fun and so that's why we're going to we're talking about a way to use, we're going to figure out a way to use tax money to go help people and give them a free chance who doesn't have, uh, in Porno for Powers, I had insurance, I had Warner Brothers, they put me through rehabs. People don't have what I had. They don't have 30 grand to go to the Betty Ford Center or insurance to cover that and this and that. So I want to find people who don't have the money or the insurance and help them figure out it's one of the hardest things that i face with the intervention work that i do it I, it, it it breaks my heart when i have a family that reach out to, reaches out to me and they're like we we just don't have any money for anything it's what, a tragedy. It, what can you do and i do the best that i can to get stuff scholarship and i do it all the time i will do whatever i can bend over backwards to get someone help and the resources just aren't there's not enough out there and uh, if I could wave a wand, I would build a freaking detox center in Texas that, a, that had 100,000 beds in the middle of nowhere. You know? I just want to save one person, just one at a time, of just course. one at a time <laughs> and go, OK, listen, we're going to, you know, we're going to pay the professionals. We're going to pay the rehabs. We're going to pay the recovery coach. Everybody's going to get paid to do a good job on you. You and your family don't have to pay anything. We've chosen to help you like a Robin hood kind of a thing. We're not stealing money. We're taking tax money. It's a 501c. So I want to learn more about that. We haven't just, you know, figured any of that out. My hope, my hope is that we can, we can utilize rich people to make a taxable donation to help people who are broke that have a disease and need help. I've actually got that opportunity right now. My, um, you know, in, in loving memory of my friend, Brad Knoll, the singer of Sublime, we've created the Knoll Family Foundation, which will be opening in 2018. It's going to be a, a six bed treatment facility in San Juan Capistrano. And it's dedicated to, to treating, and it's the only one of its kind. It'll be treating men, male musicians, uh, who are addicted to uh, heroin and opiates. And so uh, for those listening to donate, go to the Knoll Family Foundation dot org. Our first uh, uh, music musical kind of fact, we'd love to have you play as a guest. Any, uh, anything, anything you want. February got, yeah. in February, I'll be letting you know. February okay. of 2018 is going to be our first uh, benefit show at the observatory. In, um, Can in, I play acoustic with my nylon? Hell, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would be so unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, it's something it's a nonprofit. Oh, great. And and we'll be treating uh, musicians from all over the world who are sick from opiate addiction, and it's a it's a very near and dear uh, project to to my heart to treat okay. musicians who have no insurance, no money. I'm there with you, brother. That's so awesome. Yeah. Um, in in you know, I'm so blessed to to have to have had both of you on today. You know, and, and in closing, is there anything that either of you two would like to share for anyone out there who's listening 
and who may be struggling with addiction, I would like for both of you to, to share with the listeners how they can contact you guys in the event that they want some help. Okay. One of the things I didn't get to say is I have a school that helps people get certified. Share So it. if they can't afford becoming an interventionist or recovery coach, we do scholarships. We gave away $350,000 of training in the past two years. So if someone wants to learn how to do this to help other people but doesn't have the money, we'll train you to do it. Share, please and share with everybody how, how they get a hold of you. <laughs> theaddictionsacademy.com, which is plural, 1-800-706-0318, extension 2. And they can find me at theaddictionscoach.com. I do private coaching and training and sober on demand where I bring the treatment to the client wherever they are on the bus, the NFL field, the hotel, whatever. It's kind of a unique concept. I do that. And again, the same 1-800 number, 1-800-706-0318. That is awesome. Peter, any closing remarks? Um, I'm just, you know, grateful for Callie for uh, giving me a free program to, to get this, this certification and grateful for you to for what you're doing with, with the foundation and this interview. And thanks, Mike Meeker, for setting this up. And, and uh, you know, I, I just want to be guided by God and do the right thing, you know. Well, we're all looking forward to seeing you jam at the uh, Mint on Wednesday. And, uh, you know, Dr. Callie Estes and Peter DeStefano, it's been a, a joy to have you here on this beautiful, uh, on this beautiful, very heartfelt day uh, for all those people in Las Vegas. Our hearts and prayers go out to all the families uh, who are affected. And uh, you guys, thank you so much for being here with us. Have a great rest of your day and safe travels back home. For all, to all you listeners out there, to get a hold of us, please uh, reach us at, uh, what the hell is our podcast address? I always forget it. It's podcast at toddzalkins.com. You guys have a great rest of your day, and thank you guys again. Thank you. Thanks. Today's podcast is brought to you by Hope by the Sea. At Hope by the Sea, California's addiction treatment center, we develop recovery plans tailor-made for you. Drawing on evidence-based interventions and holistic modalities, we provide men and women with the tools they need to identify triggers, cope with cravings, manage stress, and reprioritize their lives. Your story is your own, and so is your treatment journey. Trust our family of facilities to bring hope and empower change. Please visit us at hopebythesea.com. You guys are located in San Juan Capistrano. They provide awesome therapeutic and clinical care. Hopebythesea.com. Those guys do awesome treatment work. Give them a shot, you guys.